All right, good morning. Thank you for getting up early on the second day here at Ignite in Georgia to join me for a conversation about how we secure the Office 365 service. My name is Sarah Manning Dawson. I have grown up through uh, my career in Exchange and then in Office 365, which was uh, something of the transformation of Exchange. I've been in uh, the engineering team for 19 years at Microsoft, everywhere from the core transport stack, um, defining uh, you know, the latest, greatest SMTP requirements, all the way up to building the mobile apps for both OA and Outlook Mobile. So a lot of experience in Exchange. And in the last four years, my focus has been in the compliance and security space. Uh, the first couple of years were with the information protection team. And if any of you were at Rudra Mitra's presentation yesterday, um, it's our customer-facing properties that help protect and secure your organization. And then in the last couple of years, I've been in the infrastructure security business. So um, myself, together with our group engineering manager, define what we do and how we do it to secure the Office 365 service. Now this, uh, this presentation, I think, becomes more and more important and becomes more and more timely as I get the opportunity to have conversations with our customers. I get uh, invited to a lot of uh, briefings, to a lot of customer uh, presentations. And there's a couple of things that I realize um, I think we, we can message better as we implement them in the fabric of our engineering. And so there's a couple of things that I hope you leave here today with. Uh, the first key takeaway is to be able to describe to yourself, to the board, to compete analysts, what it is that we do in the fabric of Office 365 to secure it in a way that you can't do in a single organization on-prem. What are those insights? The, the message I often hear is an interesting and consistent one. I'll hear people say, you know, Sarah, I figure you guys have infrastructure security you know, done pretty well. You're a huge service. You're several billion dollars. I'm sure you devote a lot of resources to it. I imagine you have pretty strong infra security, but I have no idea what you do. You know, I've seen a, a deck on defense in depth. You know, do you just take best practices and stretch them to fit your cloud service? And the answer is no. We go well beyond that with innovation, which I'll talk about today. In the same conversation, what I'll hear is, even though I believe that you're doing the right thing in your infrastructure, Sarah, no matter what, no matter what, there is a juxtaposition, there's something of a conflict with the fact that even if I trust you and trust what you're doing, I still have this perception of a loss of control when I take my data from this premise that I controlled, I bought the, the servers, the network, the data was mine, it was, it was housed in a building that I had the keys to, and I move it into a cloud service where it's, it's being presumably managed and operated by a bunch of people I don't know. And so in order to, to respond to that conversation or to give you tools to have that conversation, I'd like to go through today, I'm not going to win the control conversation, right? When it moves off your premise, you have less control. But what I'm hoping is that the, the perception you'll see is stronger than the reality. And when it comes to a cost-benefit analysis of how much more secure you are in our cloud service, the, uh, the ratio will be clear. The second thing that I hope you leave with today is a, a change in conversation about infrastructure security. At first, we, we start with talking about compliance, right? That's kind of a, a well-understood, measurable way to talk about security. And then we'll go more sophisticated. We'll talk about defense in depth and best practices and the, the best known security practices out there and how we implement them. I would like to take that conversation further and talk about how the unique properties of a high-scale cloud service actually lend itself to innovation that's not possible unless you're a high-scale cloud service. So stepping away from, from security bias, what I call security experience bias, and looking at how we run our service and how we take the properties of how we run our service to do new disruptive things that change the security game. So one of the ways that uh, security conversations are steered, and what I see in most security presentations that, that I've been to, are they start with a bunch of scary slides. 
right? The world is going to hell in a handbasket. Look what's happening to Target and Home Depot and, and Sony and Anthem and OPM and Ashley Madison. You know, everybody gets scared. And then the rest of the slides are, here are some point solutions that we offer you to get unscared. And, you know, people will see this and, and they'll, they'll set analogies or they'll, they'll have analogies in their mind to what we do and they'll say, Sarah, you know, I, I heard this conversation or I, I saw this presentation, I read about it in the news, and both Target and Home Depot, both of those companies had third-party vendor credentials that began the breach path. It was poorly managed, poor hygiene on their third-party contractors, their vendors, that led them to get breached. Tell me your best practice for expiring vendor credentials when they leave Microsoft. And what I realize is I have to unpack that conversation because we don't give vendors any sort of access to our cloud service at Microsoft because we don't give people any access to our cloud service at Microsoft. And the exception to that is very carefully controlled. It's structured so that there's, there's nobody sitting in a local admin group or in a, a forest admin group that we have to remember to pull out. That's not how it works. We use CERT-based auth, and by default, the machines run themselves, and of course, that's a nirvana state, right? There are times we have to go in and troubleshoot and collect diagnostics and figure out why it couldn't self-heal. But those are highly controlled. Those go through three or four factor. The engineer that touches the machines have to run secured remote power script paths, so hardened code, and the token that is provided to that account, which is separate from our corporate account, has very limited scope. It's specific number of minutes, specific servers, specific things that can run on those servers. So we have to unpack the conversation, and that's just an example, but what I realize is there are some analogies to running security and running a secure operations in a single on-prem org to the way we run it in the cloud. But there's also some incredible innovation opportunities that we're taking advantage of. And uh, I'd like to share them with you so that we can change the conversation. All right, so at the center, I don't have scary slides. I figure you're here because you know the state, um, the state of the world. Security is like crime. You know, it, once you have malicious actors, it, it becomes a, a bit of a, a cat and mouse problem or mouse and mouse trap. Um, so I think of it as a negative space, right? It, uh, human malice, you're dealing with emotion, it can be very, very creative, and depending on what they're motivated by, you know, it can be really hard to predict uh, the approach they're gonna take or what's gonna happen. So I trust that you're aware of some of the breaches and how they happen and why we absolutely should have an excellent industry-leading story for how we secure our infrastructure. At the core of this is that cloud security is different than traditional cybersecurity. And the way to have this conversation is to look at three facets of that. On the bottom left, this is about customer-facing security features. And they take our cloud-wide purview, the fact that we can see across our cloud, across signals in Azure, across signals in Windows Defender, to understand when a set of indicators becomes a known bad actor. And when we have high confidence, we're able to protect millions and millions of users proactively. So this is a huge advantage of a property of a cloud, right? Which is that we have millions of customers and can be very proactive. Whereas on-prem, you know, to get high confidence that something bad is occurring, you have to see it occur a few times um, so that it's, it's credible. The other two, the top and the far, your far right, are about infrastructure security. And I'd like to give you enough detail about how we run our touchless operations to give you confidence and to give you the messaging uh, to talk about how cloud scale and automation does equate to stronger security and how the more we move toward touchless operations, the more well-designed we are that human intervention is about governing and decision-making, but hardened, proven code is what actually touches our backend machines and operates our service. And that is predictable. So let's start with the middle. What does it mean? What are, what are, the, uh, what are the messages 
that, that we want to leave here with? Well, the unique properties of the cloud and how it's operated change the game. So I keep saying this, what are they? We'll go through it in, in four quadrants. Let's talk about infrastructure first. So one of the interesting things about the way we've designed Office 365, um, and I'll use Exchange Online as an example, is that we've taken uh, what used to be several different roles, CAS Hub and Mailbox, and we've coalesced them into a single role. And it was quite convenient because CAS was often processor bound, right? Uh, transport Hub was often memory bound, and uh, storage was often storage bound. The mailbox servers were often storage bound. So it was pretty nice optimization of resources to bring those together. But what it also meant is that you only have one role, and you've got hundreds of thousands of this role running across the organization, and it's all running the same stack. So not only is it running a uniform stack, when we push a build out, we push it everywhere, and now everything's running the same thing, but we own it. We write Windows Server. We write the app stack for Exchange. There's very, very little third-party software introduced into our system, right? We've got an exception with our vulnerability scanning, but that is, that's heavily regulated and tested, and it took us about a year and a half to roll it out. So in general, we own the stack that's running on the machine. This doesn't just accrue to easier monitoring, easier troubleshooting, uh, easier automation and diagnostics. I'm going to put that down. Got, a, <laughs> got a happy figures. Um, doesn't just accrue to, to monitoring and diagnostics, but what this means is we know what those machines should be doing. We know what the execution stack should and shouldn't be executing. We know what communications should be going out, and if a role should ever have an egress to, to some endpoint or not. Now, that's a little oversimplified. Sometimes there's a gray area, right? If, if we have to do Active Directory Federation, our customers have their own ADFS. We need to understand and learn where that endpoint is, and so there's certainly a range. But outside of a range, we can lock down what these machines are doing, what ports they're ever talking to, and, and where they go beyond that, what protocols they're, they're talking with. And what that allows us to do is, is lock down the machine so that we create this finite space in which detections can work. The second thing is about automation, right? We, we worked toward automation mostly for service health, right? That's where it began. What we found What we found is that not only do we have automated processes for workflows that were predictable, like deploying code, deploying our builds, um, and collecting data for logging, but we could also get very, very clever about self-recovery. And the reason we felt good about getting clever about self-recovery is you know, something would, would signal that a server uh, was in ill health. Something would show that something you know, was struggling or uh, our availability was dipping, and an engineer would go in and examine what was going on and see that a set of patterns, a set of particular signals put together meant that they had to do some action. And when they were able to see that that meant, to do the, that, that meant they had to take some action, they just added a rule, and they automated it. All right, this must be on a timer. Let me, let me just fix this. And so year after year, what we would do is look at the set of signals and what would have to happen based on that set of signals to self-heal. And what was interesting is there's only a handful of things, whether it's a human or an automated system, there's only a handful of things we can do, right? We restart an app pool, we restart a service, we reboot the machine, or we create a hardware ticket because something's pretty host, right? Sound familiar? If you run IT, you know, there, there's, there's often a finite set of things that you can respond to. 
And as we created these rules, even as we scaled orders of magnitude, right, we double in size about every one and a half to two years, even as we scaled, the number of humans that had to intervene in a self-healing process that wasn't going well or that was failing went down. So the automation for speed and reliability and predictability led to pulling human interaction out of the system. And as we drove toward that, security got involved because pulling humans out of the system means not only pulling human malice out of the system, but pulling tired engineers, right? And green engineers and mistaken engineers or sloppy engineers out of the system. And even though one is service health and one is security, the consequences can be the same. And so our automation accrues to both and is very important. Data is distributed and redistributed across hundreds of thousands of machines. This one creates some really interesting opportunities for us. For example, all right, I have a pop quiz, and I even have swag up here. Uh, I think these are three-in-one adapters, um, but I, I haven't opened the box because I didn't want it to look open, so I don't know, it's possible there's like a baby ferret in here, in, <laughs> in which case take good care. Um, so a pop quiz, the Verizon Data Be Breach Investigation Report provides some wonderful data, and they talk about the three biggest motivating factors for breach, and they are finance, espionage, and just grudge, emotion, ideology, is that third tier. Any guesses, round to the nearest 5%, any guesses what percent uh, is ideology or grudge? 35 to 40, nope, that's high. It's actually lower than that. And 15%, no, 20%. 20%, it's actually lower than that. 10, who said five? All right, I'll give that to you. Just raise your hand and Carolyn will help me out. Only 5%. You know, not that we're not emotional, mercurial creatures, we are, right? Humans get, get mad. Um, but finance and espionage has, has huge pay, payback. So that actually counts finance, I think, is 70%, and espionage is 25% of breach motivations. So the interesting thing about this, which is related to this point, is that both finance and espionage, like if you're just trying to cause trouble because you're mad, you can like DOS a system, right? You, you can just be a pain. But finance and espionage are about getting to data and having to target data, right? If you're spying on someone, you gotta figure out what server to go on that has their stuff, right? If you want financial gain, you gotta find where those banks' mailboxes are, you know, in order to add the forwarding rule. We have the advantage of being able to obfuscate, of being able to hide the mapping between which machines and which mailboxes sit on those machines, even from our internal engineers. Even from our, we call them DevOps. They're the people who write the code actually also operate the service, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, but we, we can mask that such that the mapping can only be retrieved through a certificate that can only be retrieved through a coded path. And imagine this, if we hide that mapping, right? If an engineer sees a bunch of signals going, going south on a machine, they don't need to know which mailboxes are on that, right? They need to go diagnose it and fix it. If an engineer gets a support call and someone asks them to run some diagnostic on the mailbox, they don't have to know which server it's on, right? They can run a PowerShell script. The script can go figure it out, right, using a, a cert that can only be retrieved through code. And so this basically thwarts 95% of the motivation of infrastructure attacks, right? It's not perfect. It's a lot of work. But we get to hide data in scale because in exchange alone, in uh, our Outlook services, I guess is the new name, Outlook services, we have over 200,000 pretty heavy machines with a lot of mailboxes on them. Another really interesting property about the data distribution and redistribution across hundreds of thousands of machines is that we're constantly load balancing, right? That, that data is moving. It's moving a lot. We have four copies in the Exchange uh, online service. We have four copies of the data, and we're load balancing just to optimize resources. We also, when we deploy builds, we wipe the machine. We take it out of rotation, 
We wipe the machine, we re-image it, and we install the new build. We do that every week. Right? So this is a, a very agile service. So what happens, um, I've actually listed under challenges, but it's related to the fact that this, this stack is very agile. Right? Even though we know at a given time everything that's running on a machine, it changes. And so related to this, it, this creates a challenge. And the middle challenge there says stack is extremely agile. The reason that's a challenge is because we're, we're constantly creating new apps. We're creating new microservices. We're buying companies and integrating them into Office 365. Right? There's Yammer. There's LinkedIn. We bought Volometrics, um, Delve onboarded. And again, you know, there's, there's Planner. There's a bunch of new apps. Things build by build change all the time in our data center. So this, this creates an interesting problem for detections. Because there's this conventional wisdom, right? That, OK, Sarah, we've locked down as much as we can because we know what the machine should be doing. But what's left is a set of detections, right? Because the places where we're, we can't absolutely lock down, we can watch for things that we don't expect. And conventional wisdom says, you know, with, with all this machine intelligence, we can do great anomaly detection, right? And sometimes that's true. But there's a couple of things that work against this traditional wisdom of just looking at anomaly behavior based on past history. Number one is sheer scale. All right, anyone want to hazard a guess how many uh, Windows Server events we collect into our detection engine every day? And what I'll tell you is it's 1.2 times 10 to some number. Guess, anyone want to guess that number? It, 10 to the what? A million would be 10 to the 9, right? Oh, no, that's a billion. <laughs> 10 to the 6. It is not 7. Anyone else? 11. Were you at my RSA talk? All right. I did. I, I asked that question last year at RSA as well. It is 1.2 times 10 to the 11. So every day, we have 120 billion signals into this detection engine. And we approached it a couple of years ago the way everybody approaches it. Oh my god, we're going to get the best machine learners. We're going to get the best data scientists. And they're going to sift through that. And they're going to figure out how to pop these anomalies that we know shouldn't happen. They'll look back across 30 days worth of data, even though we wipe and replace our, our servers every week. They'll still look back and, and look for lurkers and, and weird things happening. And so we, we did just that. We, we got eight or nine people from MIT, just experts in data science. We set up an office in Cambridge. We, we gave them the data, and we said, OK, go to it. Pop anomalies. And maybe, you know, maybe they, they could have been successful over a long period of time. It's an awful lot of data. But they had a second aspect working against them. And it's exactly what I'm talking about here, that our stack is agile. Right? We onboard new services, new apps, new things almost daily. Right? Office 365 is a lot of different workloads doing a lot of different things. So what you end up with is you end up with this problem you've asked people to solve, which says, hey, find the needle in the haystack. By the way, your, your haystack's about the size of Jupiter. And over time, everything looks like a needle. So it, it is the wrong approach just looking at history. It's the wrong approach for us to detect um, anomalies. What we do, and actually what most of the industry is doing, is much simpler. Right? In the cloud, we work to restrict, to limit what we know should never happen. And we have a lot of luxuries that let us do that well. And that creates a finite space where we can actually create rules, point rules where we know something might vary, but it should never vary in this set of combinations. Or this behavior you know, should happen, but it should never happen in this set of combinations. Uh, Google, so it, it's funny, right? Infrasecurity makes strange bedfellows. Um, we tend, the, the big four in Seattle, Amazon, Google, us, and Facebook, we tend um, from an infrasecurity to, to talk a lot and you know, to share best practices and, and work together. It's one of the few places where, the, where we put the friend in front of me, right? Um, but one of the things Google did in a talk 
with Stanford, they, they went to a Stanford CS class, it's online under stanford.edu, they talked about their issue with approaching anomaly detections by simply looking at history and trying to do brilliant machine science, you know, to pop anomalies. And, and they had the same experience. They said that the false positives are just through the roof, right? When we have our red team come in, they, they're like number 99,000 among the stack. Well, that's pretty good accuracy among 120 billion, but it, it's not good enough, right? Because you've got 99,000 false positives on top of it. So Google also moved to rule-based detections in their cloud service. All right, so we've talked about the properties, challenges. We've talked about the stack being agile. The accountability falls to us, but that's why you pay us, right? That's why you pay licensing fees. You say, look, Microsoft, you got to take care of my, the network. You got to take care of the servers. You got to give us great productivity tools. Give us the latest, greatest. Keep it up to date. Keep it, uh, keep it low latency. Keep it highly available. Keep it secure. And, and that's our promise. But it's a big one. And uh, one of the reasons I, I and uh, my team exist is to keep that promise from a security perspective. All right, from a customer perspective, that single property is a pretty powerful one, right? The signals detect and act upon bad actors are service-wide. And so this is what I mentioned before, which advanced threat protection and features of that nature are taking advantage of, which is when we learn something, we can proactively uh, rescue or, or help uh, everyone else in the service and stop them from, from suffering the impact of a bad actor. So the challenge from a customer perspective is that you know, we've, we've got this service that does all kinds of this, you know, productivity activities. You know, like I say, we offer, uh, we, we work to offer low latency, we, we offer a lot of value add services, but at the core of that, of course, is your data. It's your stateful data, right? That's what it acts upon. But we've got this interesting paradox, right, where both you and I, both you, your org, and Microsoft don't want Microsoft to have anything to do with that core data. We don't want to touch it, we don't want to own it, we want you to believe you have um, you know, the level of control you need, you have the level of privacy you need, the level of autonomy you need. And so figuring out a model in which we can, we can communicate that or prove you know, our, our data handling and prove that you really are owners of your data and we're just stewards is a very difficult problem given that the data is sitting in our data center but it's a very important one. All right. So, so that's what I mean when I talk about the unique properties of the cloud allowing us to, uh, to create a security environment and to secure the service in a way that a, a single organization on-prem can't. Now, let's talk a little bit about just the, the sheer scale. I'll give you a little bit of background on Office 365 because this will, will speak to why automation is paramount and that automation feeds into touchless operations, which makes us more secure. So our, our SLA is four nines availability. So what that means is if you pull out your phone and you go connect, one in 10,000 times, you will, you will see a failure and if you hit refresh, it'll work then. That's our goal or less, one in 10,000 or less. In the Exchange, in the Outlook services world alone, in our, our Exchange Online Forest, we have 70 plus billion client requests per day. And so this explains the 120 billion Windows, uh, Windows security events. A lot of clients connecting. We have an exabyte, over an exabyte of physical storage. We have 400 petabytes of logical storage, but again, we have four copies of the data, sorry, over 300, under 400 at this point, but with, uh, with four copies of the data, that means a lot of physical storage. And uh, across the, all of the workloads, so including SharePoint, Skype, uh, Yammer, and all of our, all of our microservices, uh, we host over a million servers. And from the Exchange Online, we deliver three and a half customer messages per day. So not only do we have a set of major services, which include SharePoint Online, OneDrive for Business, and probably the biggest driver of cloud adoption, which is Exchange Online. We have a lot of microservices. If you go to the Waffle in our suite portal, 
I mean the like suite as in a suite of tools, although it is pretty sweet as well. Um, if you look at that, there's a, a number of different uh, microservices that you can use like Planner and Delve and Weave and, and that list is growing. So uh, a lot of different services and microservices, but we also have a lot of flavors of the cloud that we maintain and operate. And so when I talk about infrastructure security, I'm talking about all of them. Multi-tenant is by far our biggest. That's the most common. Um, actually, how many of you have some presence in Office 365, whether it's E1, E3, or E5? How many of you are in there? All right. So most of you are probably in multi-tenant. You know, Live at EDU is our, our free offer for students. Um, Enterprise Cloud is, is also uh, called Dedicated, and it's sort of a white glove, higher touch service. Um, a little more costly, but a, a little higher service. Consumer is better known as Hotmail. We have our internal staging forest, and that's where we have to eat our own dog food. We let our code bake and make sure that it's high quality before rolling out to production. Um, ITAR meets military grade standards, and our sovereign clouds now in both China and Germany not only keep the data within a country, but all the operations and decisions are made by domestic people living in that country. And so we have to go through them um, for all our, our tooling and troubleshooting and um, decision making. And finally, you know, beyond just protecting uh, customer data, we, we have a reputation to protect. So, uh, you know, from my perspective, we need to keep in mind it, it's a big service. It's the fastest growing enterprise service in Microsoft history. 80% of Fortune 500 companies have a presence in Office 365 you know, somewhere in that set of workloads. Um, and finally, we were voted the number one business-to-business -business brand, and Business Insider uh, made the comment that this is driven by its Office 365 programs. So, uh, you know, one of the things that it's my job to protect is, is this reputation. Um, and the, the final thought on, on that center, um, that center node in the triangle that, that uh, the unique properties of the cloud give us some, some uh, great new innovation paths. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, um, things like Azure, some of the stuff that Azure offers is either infrastructure as a service, so the very basic cloud platforms, or platform as a service like SQL. We are software as a service which means we own the stack all the way up to the application layer. Now, there are, there are some parts of the application layer that, of course, you will own. If you're deploying client code on endpoints that comes and talks to our service, of course, that's on the customer side. But the bits that run Exchange Online and SharePoint Online, those are our responsibility. One of the things that I, I just wanted to mention uh, from this slide is that when we talk about security beyond compliance, we'll often go to talking about defense in depth. And we'll show a diagram with this, stat, with this stack, and then we'll talk about everything we do all the way up this stack to protect it. Well, that's a, that's a very important aspect of security, and we do a lot of defense in depth. And I'll give a few quick examples of, of how we secure uh, the bottom layer, the hardware, the physical data center, the network, and servers. When we talk about the apps and data and runtime, the biggest takeaway from here is about the touchless operations and how we secure access to these machines and the app stack running on them. So in terms of the physical data center, um, you know, we're, uh, they're, they're highly secured. There's card key entry, there's guards, there's cameras. Um, guards have to undergo a pretty strict background check. Uh, the actual boxes are, are locked. Um, you know, you can't get to a box unless there's a, a hardware ticket to have to rip and replace something. Um, at, the, <clears throat> at the storage layer, uh, all of our drives are BitLocker, BitLocker encrypted. The TPMs are kept separately. Um, we now have UEFI enabled servers. So for those of you uh, who don't know what that is, what happens is in the firmware, the network BIOS, right, we, we wanna make sure there's no tampering between where it was manufactured and when it's running our code. And so we create a hash of what, whatever the BIOS, the current BIOS creates, and the OEM will give us their hash, and they have to match. And if they don't match, then we know that the BIOS is not in the same state uh, as when it was manufactured. So we support UEFI. Uh, in terms of the OS layer, we have, um, we have a, a, 
a very quick uh, scanning and patching process. Uh, the patching process uh, is, is connected to our deployment train when they're not critical patches, but for you know, emergency patching, uh, we have ways to immediately deploy. In fact, uh, the last zero day that we had, we got it onto every server worldwide, which is hundreds of thousands in seven hours. And uh, in a future slide, I'll just talk quickly about that deployment process. Uh, but the point of this is that, yes, defense in depth is critical. We practice it. But we want to go beyond that into innovations that we can only do because we're a high-scale cloud service. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about these three, these three nodes, right? These are the, the mandates, the things that we want to do to take advantage of the properties of the cloud to better secure it. Let's start by talking about um, the customer-facing security. Our mandate is that security learnings from one customer benefit everyone. I've mentioned a couple, I've mentioned a, a breakout session and also someone's name. I'll show you a couple of things that are using you know, cloud power to better secure customers. If you want to learn more, that top breakout session will talk about Secure Score, which is the assessment tool that I'm about to show you. And that, the guy at the bottom, his name's Phil Newman, he's on our information protection team. He has a few sessions, and all of them relate to this concept of, um, of using sort of cloud-wide uh, purview or, or cloud-wide uh, signals in order to protect customers. So he'll talk about things like advanced threat protection and safe links and safe attachments. So I have, uh, I have three program management teams um, that report up to me, and two of them are infra. One is secure access, and then one is what we call secure site, which secures the, the rest of the stack. But the third has been looking at customer-facing investments. And our focus has been on giving customers tools to assess the state of security so they can be proactive about improving it where they've missed something that Office 365 offers. And before we did that, I asked them to participate in a program we call RAVE. And what it is is when someone calls support, right, and support figures out what the concern is, our engineers get on the call and help those customers through their issue. And it does a couple things, right? It gives us a reality check when, when customers struggle with our product or if there is something that's, that's not obvious that we thought was obvious. Uh, and it also, it also gives uh, you know, customers sort of a direct feedback channel to us uh, and, and direct help from the engineering teams that really know vertically uh, everything about the area. And so we would literally like turn on a, what was similar to a chat window and wait for customers who were calling support because they had been breached. And some of these cases were, were frankly heartbreaking. The, the, the good thing that came out of uh, a, a lot of struggles that these customers had have, and these were like you know, six figure and in one case a seven figure loss, uh, because of a breach, the, the thing that came out of it is we started to recognize clear patterns. It was, it was actually quite surprising how quickly these surfaced. What we found is that phishing was almost always involved along the breach path. And so the work we're doing with ATP, you know, please do educate yourself um, this, this week. If you're interested in this area, please do educate yourself in, in the work that we're doing in advanced threat protection and some of the features within it. Because phishing, social engineering to get credentials. So I'm not talking about malware on the machine. Um, I'm talking specifically about phishing to get credentials was almost always along the path of breach. The other thing we noticed is these, these guys or gals were, were quite slick. They would, they would sit with access to a mailbox or multiple mailboxes or a tenant admin mailbox for weeks or months. And they would watch the mail flow through. Um, and I'll explain how in a second. But they would learn the financial practices, how POs were issued, how POs were approved. And then they would, just, they would insert themselves into the process and be out of there before anyone understood that there was a rogue inserted in the process. There were three things that we saw that allowed these attackers to do it and to linger. So 
you have a little bit of time. I mean, not always. I can't make any promises. But understand, these were, these were slow. And so if you're quick to pick up the three big, biggest indicators, I think you can keep your organizations much more secure. The biggest three mechanisms were through forwarding rules added on a mailbox, admins added to tenant admin or, or some kind of elevated access, and delegates added to a mailbox. Those were the three, the three patterns that popped in the way these rogues started to learn the organization. Forwarding rules, understand there's a couple of ways to add forwarding rules. You can do it through inbox rules in Outlook. There's also an Active Directory setting that only admins can put that does automatic forward at the transport layer. So understand there's a couple of ways. And please watch for that. So how do you watch for it? How do you help protect your organization? Well, from this learning, there's actually a talk that will go into specific case studies. They're totally anonymized, and they're with permission from the customer on, with the, the clear guidance that they will be totally anonymized. But this will walk through some of our case studies so that you understand um, you know, some of the ways that, um, that the rogues will try to infiltrate the org and, and gain financially. So probably the best way to recognize when these things are happening is through the Office 365 Management Activity API. Right now, it's an endpoint that we publish. And the endpoint includes the user activity, admin activity, and if at any point you call support and Microsoft has to do something against your tenant, it will include that in the logs as well. Um, we are building some user interface to surface these, to start doing notifications and alerting. But these ISVs certainly have a jump. The first thing we did was got the, got the API complete and published. And so there's a number of ISVs. This is a short list. There's far more than this. These were just the first people to jump on board. But they've built all kinds of great tooling against this endpoint, this activity endpoint, that will give you dashboards and notifications and alerting and all kinds of good stuff that if, if you run a SOC or some semblance of a SOC, um, you can take advantage of. So if nothing else, configure those fads, forwarding, new admins, and delegates added to mailboxes. All right, a, a second area where uh, having cloud-wide purview or, or being in a cloud service can add value to single customers uh, is in something that we've built that we call the Office 365 Secure Score. And it's really meant to be like a credit score. It's a, it's an, I'll call it a loose assessment, because a credit score doesn't guarantee you anything, right? Just because you have a high credit score, you may default on something uh, when times are down. But it gives a really strong indicator, a risk indicator, um, to, to lending agencies. So like this, uh, we've created a, a secure score that can give you a number that basically rates how well you are protected against risk versus how much you could be. And uh, the idea is twofold. It's, first of all, to provide you with a boardroom metric, you know, something, some quantifiable metric that you can, you can show progress against. And also, because it goes into detail about where those numbers came from, it will surface all of the, the properties, all the features across Office 365 that can help you to lower risk. One of the, the challenges we have that unfortunately you as customers probably feel is we've got these org boundaries where we've got Active Directory you know, under a whole different EVP than Office 365. So you've got you know, your, your uh, login and vulnerability assessment and a bunch of stuff in the Active Directory identity portal. And you've got some stuff maybe in our security and compliance portal, and there's stuff in our admin portal, and so on. And sometimes it's hard to find. And we are working to bring those together. But one of the things this will do is just give you a list of everything you can do to better secure your service and, and link to it, no matter what portal it's in. And so you can have an inventory of ways that you can better protect your service. And uh, it's available now. It's in preview. So it hasn't, uh, what we call GA, it hasn't, um, hasn't been fully launched yet or released. But you can get to it, and I'll show you how, actually. I'll do a quick demo. It is, yep. All 
All right. Um, so if you want to uh, work with the secure score right now, just go to aka.ms slash 0365 secure score. All right, and you won't see this. I've already done the provisioning to, um, to get it working. You'll, you'll just go through a couple of steps to collect and report on your first secure score. Um, I believe you need tenant admin um, credentials, but I'll, I'll tell you the link uh, later on in the deck. I'll give you a link to where there's an entire breakout session on Friday just about secure score. So big deep dive uh, into this uh, by Brandon Kaler, who's also on the security engineering team. Uh, but the way it works, uh, first of all, when you go in, you'll see just some instruction, a little bit more information on it. You can close that. And what you see here is I'm in a, a test tenant right now, but it's a real tenant. And I have a secure score of 128 of 243. So of the stuff I have turned on right now, I'm not utilizing all of it. I could be up to 243. But then if I look across all the possible tooling that we provide in Office 365, and some of it you know, may, may require a, a different license, but I can look across all of the tooling to figure out how to raise my score even higher. So if I've got a huge security team and we're in, what I can do is choose my target score. I want my credit score, my security score, to be 500. OK, let's do 499. And then what it'll do is it'll take the top 45 actions that you can take in order to raise your secure score that high. If you say, look, I only have a couple of people. I'm a, a medium-sized business. I, you know, I, I just don't have that many people to devote to it. What are the first five things I should do? Well, then set your target score lower, right? You, you can have a plan that you can review with the board for, for how you're going to increase this. But set it lower for now. And it will give you the, the top suggestions for uh, what you can do to increase your score. So you'll see some that are not scored. We're still building um, some of the, the connections uh, to, to these properties. So that's why it's still in beta. But we expect it to GA by the end of the year. So here's an example. Enable MFA for tenant admins. Right, right now, it's 30 out of 50. It says, we found that you had seven admins out of 18 that did not have MFA enabled. And so that's why we only got 30. And if you click Learn More, it'll actually take you to a page where you can launch the console that will let you, let you make that change. And what we're striving to do in this coming year is actually have, um, you know, embed the, uh, the controls right into the secure score where you can say, you know, enable MFA, rather than having to go to like the Active Directory console. So we're, we're working to shorten the paths to actually remediate some of this stuff. And it's a little bit of, it's you know, a boardroom metric, but it's also you know, a bit of, of gamification. Now, this is all really contextual to a, a single tenant. right? How does the fact that we're a cloud service help you in this context? right? Because it, it's really quite localized to your organization. Well, what we're working on is a way that you can see how your secure score compares, fully anonymized, of course, and, and highly aggregated. But how does your secure score compare to other people in the same industry as you? How does your secure score compare against other people that are the same size as you? Right? What, what are the trends that people are doing, and what are people ignoring, um, which help not only define best practices, but feedback to us, you know, features that even when customers are aware of them are not getting used, so we can ask all the right questions. Uh, one more thing to show you about secure scores. There's a second tab here. And again, it's aka.ms slash 0365 secure score. And there's a breakout session on Friday that's all secure score. Um, but there's a, a score analyzer here that can show you what your score has done over time. When I was added as a tenant admin, the score went here. It was 130 on this date. It dropped down to 129. And the reason is because having too many tenant admins is bad. Having too few is bad. So if you have it between two and five, you get the maximum points uh, for tenant admins. And there's also uh, tweaks we're adding where you can say, ignore, you know, this doesn't really apply to me, or I've decided I am not going to put Intune on mobile devices. Just get that out of, out of my secure score or whatever.
All right, so uh, a couple of examples of how cloud learnings can help protect your organization and give you more information. Uh, in the last 25 minutes, let's, let's move on to talking about infrastructure and how what we do in the infrastructure creates a, a security environment that we feel is advantageous to anything that can be created on-prem in a single org. So we've talked about this owning the stack, right? We're the one that writes the stack, we own the stack, we know what it should do. So how do we do that? Well, we start with uniform multi-role servers. As I mentioned, we brought CAS, Hub, and Mailbox all into one, and we heavily restrict the number of different roles. So the number of different server types. We've got the mailbox servers. In the, in the uh, Exchange Online Forest, we've, we've got these mailbox servers that are coalesced from these three roles. We, of course, have Active Directory machines. We've got our management machines, which are all in their own forest, and they basically run the scripts that, that auto-manages the, the data center, the touchless operations. We've, of course, got CAFE, which uh, is sort of our, our front end, which does a lot of the auth and load balancing. And then we've got uh, edge servers, which are shared across a number of different cloud services. It's just, it gets us closer to the endpoint to lower the latency for client connections. And uh, you know, that, that's it. And we, we work to reduce in every data center, in every workload, the number of different uh, types of machines. Uh, you know, not only, as I mentioned before, that makes it easy to maintain, but it also allows us to build a map of what should and shouldn't be happening on these roles. So we can tightly restrict what we allow to happen and have a finite set of rules that can help with higher fidelity detections. So, so how does this actually work? How do, we, how do we really, under the covers, run this? in a touchless way. You know, with 200,000 servers and billions and billions of events, like, is that for real? Well, one of the things that uh, it's probably helpful to explain <clears throat> is that in our service, we don't have operators. Uh, the, the people who operate the service are those, the people that we hire to write the code. Our developers, whose expertise is in writing code, are also responsible for the health, the maintenance, and the troubleshooting of that code in the data center. So it sounds difficult, right? And it is. They're not experts in this area. But let me tell you how quickly code quality increases when you get woken up in the middle of the night because some availability metric is dipping because of what you've checked in a few days ago. It's amazing for code quality, but you know, if it were that simple, we would burn out all of our engineers and we'd have, we'd have uh, you know, huge turnover. The way we avoid that is we have a huge investment, a team, I'm on the team, it's, a, it's called a foundations team, and we build a thick service fabric to make it very, very easy for these engineers who are code experts to be able to plug into our monitoring pipelines, to our deployment pipelines, to our build pipelines, to our security requirements, to the data collection for logs. Make it really, really easy for them to be able to maintain the health of what they do, to be able to troubleshoot what they do in a way where they don't all have to become experts in these areas. And so there's a very, very heavy investment in this fabric. Because of this heavy investment, we've got, uh, we've got something called central admin, which is the brain that runs everything, basically. It's the brain that runs our operations, and um, it's within the service fabric as well. So it does all the orchestration of deployment. Someone says, okay, the build's done, right? Central admin picks up the build and deploys it across our machines. It does the patching, it does the monitoring. We have external probes that come in. We've got local active monitoring. The diagnostic and perf counters, central admin will alert. It will actually um, you know, fire off the, the self-healing algorithms. When something dips below availability, it'll check it X minutes later, and it'll keep trying things until hopefully in a rare event, and it's becoming more and more rare, it, it gives up because self-healing isn't working, and it will then page the on-call engineer. And by the way, because engineers are responsible for maintenance. All of us, including me, we have to be in on-call rotations. Um, mine, because I'm, I'm management overhead, I'm the incident manager. So it only goes up to me when, when an on-call rotation responsible for that code area can't figure it out 
and there's a service outage, then the incident manager will get woken up in the middle of the night. But it's, it's painful for all of us, which is huge motivation for us to improve our processes and our self-healing. So um, the diagnostic in PERF, uh, you know, it'll, it'll work to self-heal when something goes amiss. And if central admin simply isn't able to self-heal, it'll, it'll uh, send the page to the on-call team that owns that code base. Um, and so notifications and alerting, uh, provisioning and directory, of course, we, we add services, we add people, we add mailboxes, we add new organizations, all of that automated through central admin. So what does this mean? This brain, which lives in its own forest with a bunch of machines, is it, the way to think of it is it's a set of workflows. It's got a scheduler, and then it's got a set of intelligent sort of flow charts or decision making around self-healing. That's, that's the sum of central admin. It runs about 200 million workflows a day to handle our operations in our cloud service. And so what does that mean? Well, here's an example from April 2013 to 15. Our Exchange Forest active commercial users went up fourfold, four times. And by simply iterating, every single time a human got involved, creating a rule where we had high confidence to have it self heal next time, we've actually been able to lower the number of paging alerts, and that is still going down as we scale, as we double in size every year and a half to two years. And so how does this deployment work? How do we make sure that the quality of code is high? Well, deployment uh, is in stages, and it's purposely slowed down, except in the case of uh, outages or zero-day patches. If we have to get code out quickly, we know how to do that. We'll hammer it. There's usually a conference bridge. This is kind of rare. There's a conference bridge. Rajesh Jar, our, v our VP, will often be on it, so it's pretty high pressure. Uh, we'll test the code very carefully, and we'll start rolling it out, monitoring it with a lot of hand-holding, but we'll do it as quickly as uh, the quality indicators will, will give us confidence that we can. But in this case, we actually don't go worldwide until we let it bake in each of these rings for about a week. So it takes about four weeks for code to, grow, to go worldwide. And again, this is because we don't have operators, we don't have testers, right? We're, we're all engineers writing code, um, and, and we also maintain the service ourselves uh, with the very thick uh, fabric layer that I talked about uh, built by the foundations team, which is the one that I'm on. So when there's a broad service-wide incident or when there's a zero-day attack, we absolutely speed this process up. And again, seven hours the last time we had to do this. We had worldwide saturation. Now, uh, in terms of building code, right? It, you know, it's great that we've secured our operations, we're touchless. What about the code, right? How do we make sure that's at quality and secure? Well, code undergoes a lot of scrutiny. There are code, um, code reviews. There's, the code is peer reviewed. We also do samples that are reviewed by an external audit. Um, and uh, we do a lot of static code analysis to make sure that we're not putting our customers at risk. We also make sure that nothing can interfere with the code between the time it's checked in and when it's built through, um, through a secured certificate uh, signing the artifacts. And again, we have this huge advantage where because we write the code that's running in the data center, at code time, we have started to innovate in this area, writing automation that can read what's happening in the code and either add that to the detections engine as rules or further limit what those boxes can do in terms of the execution or comm stack based on what the engineer's code said it should. Now, this is a complex task. We have a long way to go. But it's a huge advantage to us because we, we know what should be running. We tell it through code. All right, so just to summarize, cloud scale and automation, some of the things we're able to do with very tight machine communication and execution, not only heavily restrict what can happen on our, on our stack, on the machines, uh, but be pretty smart about detections. Uh, using build time intelligence to create a detections mapping. Hiding data in scale, as I mentioned before, thwarting 95% of attacks by hiding the mapping between mailboxes and 
uh, and the servers that they're running on. And one thing I haven't mentioned yet, we even automate our red team. Right? Our, our red team does surgical, very careful things to try to shine lights into the dark corner of the data centers you know, that we believe we've heavily secured. And we've challenged them for everything that they do to create a, a hacker bot to perform it randomly you know, on its own through central admin. Central admin goes and runs it, and it's in a you know, do no harm kind of way. Um, so they're, they're pretty specific about how they do it. But it not only challenges our detection engines, but it allows us to have the, the one operational team that I believe we should keep forever, right? The, I, I believe engineering should replace operations except in the case of a red team. They are invaluable. But we even, we even automate that to some extent. We'll, we'll always keep our red team, um, but now we, we kind of multiply their value by having the, this hacker bot. All right, so the, the final facet of uh, how cloud security is different and how that creates an advantage while still respecting your data privacy and your data control is about how this touchless operation has led us to make sure code and not people operate our service and that human intervention is limited and humans only make decisions. And they, they execute those decisions through hardened, proven, trusted coded paths. All right, so we talk about CA, right? I've talked about how it, it's, it's wonderfully automated and 200 million workflows a day that humans don't have to do. But just to get real, the only certainty, right, the certainties that I know of are death taxes, and at some point something fails at scale, right? That it's, a, it's just a math problem, right? Something will fail at scale. Central admin will not know how to recover from it. And we've got to involve a human in diagnosing, troubleshooting, figuring out what's going on with a machine or a router or you know, sometimes a, a broader outage. And when I say outage, you know, we, we consider it an, an incident when we see availability drop on more than one machine below 99.9. .9. Um, so our, we use the term outage for things that you may not even know or feel or ever see, but for us it's, it's just unacceptable in running a, you know, a an X billion dollar service. So what happens when humans do need to intervene? How does this work in a way that you can trust us and, uh, and believe that your data is safe? Well, what happens is I'm an engineer. I get woken up in the middle of the night. I see a page. And literally, we hear Rajesh's recorded voice on, on the phone uh, because it's central admin that calls us. And it, we all have terrible memories of, of Rajesh waking us up in the middle of the night. Um, <clears throat> but once that happens, we have to figure out what's going on and use our, our diagnostics dashboard, our service health dashboard, to see if we can figure it out just from the signals. But if we can't, if we have to go and get further or more information from a specific machine or a set of machines, then we have to decide what it is we need. And we create something, um, we create a ticket that's basically called a lockbox ticket. So as I mentioned before, no one has standing access to the service. If you look in local admin on any of the machines running your mailboxes, if you look at domain admins, we don't have user accounts in there. What we do is we create a ticket through lockbox, and that ticket goes to a manager for approval. And it's a three-factor approval, <clears throat> because the manager not only needs to approve it, um, but MFAs. And in the very rare case, that the engineer feels like they need to run some script that reveals something about your data. It's through a path which we, we mark as access to customer data. And if you have the lockbox feature, you will be involved in the approval chain. Understand that's a very rare scenario for us. Actually, I'll, maybe I'll let you guess. Any guesses, on average, how, how often for an average tenant, we need to run through an access to customer data path. Is it once every three days? Once a year. Once a year. That's not correct. Any other guesses? 15 months. For an average tenant, you can expect us to have to access customer data once every 3,300 years. 
Once every 3,300 years, we have almost 3 million tenants. And that path, which is almost always spurned, or spawned, <laughs> spurned, spawned through a support call, we run about 30 times a month. And so if you do the math, the average tenant will ever have to approve for us a, a access to customer data path once every 3,300 years. So who was going to say 3,300? Because I have one more giveaway. <laughs> All right, you were first with your hand up. You get a three-in-one adapter. Just keep your hand up. Um, yeah, so, so access to customer data is a whole different ball game and happens very, very rarely. But a, a little bit less rarely is when you get woken up and you have to just go get logs off a machine because whatever we've provided in our service health dashboard just isn't enough. And so an engineer will ask for approval, and they'll be crystal clear about which machines they need to talk to. It's called scope. What PowerShell commandlets they will need to run remotely and for how long. And in that lockbox request that goes to managers, they'll ask for all that. Now, if it's approved, here's what happens. We have a forest with uh, what we call Taurus accounts. This, this process is, is run by a, a technology we've named Taurus. And that Taurus forest has no trust relationship anywhere. It's off on its own in terms of trust relationship and certainly doesn't have trust with our management or our capacity for us. And when I say capacity, that's the stuff that runs all, all the customer data. But the, the, the Taurus forest will talk to a worker process that we built, we've customized it, we build a worker process on every machine that it will request a token from. And that worker process will examine the ticket. It will say, okay, yeah, this has been approved. It's gone through lockbox. All the background checks are clear. I will issue you a token, Taurus account. This is all done through TLS. For these servers, for this many minutes, to run these scripts. And our Taurus worker process makes sure that whatever that engineer does is sandbox exactly to what was, uh, what was granted. And once that token expires, the token expires, and they have to go through lockbox again if they want. And understand, this is still running paths, running script, rather than letting, just giving someone you know, local admin access to a box and letting them do whatever they want. It's, um, it, it's, it's highly managed, and of course, it's audited as well. And as I mentioned, um, the customer, if you have customer lockbox, and you know, in 3,300 years, we, we need to access your data, um, you are part of the approval chain and can make a decision whether or not you think we should be, should be looking at your stuff. So just a summary of this third of the, the three points of the triangle. Um, we strive towards self-healing and reducing human interaction. Self-healing means reducing human interaction. If there must be human interaction, we do it through remote access only via code you know, very, very rarely do it, does an engineer need interactive access to a machine, and that's a, a different, more rigorous path. Uh, it's enforced by this Taurus account. It's not a Microsoft account. Uh, in order to get a Taurus account, there's more rigorous background checks that our users have to go through um, because it, it's what enables you to ask for a token to get access to uh, run script on a data center machine. Um, and all the access is time bound and it's scope bound, and it's based on, on who's asking and, and what's been approved. And then, of course, we always default to not touching the data. Any, any mechanism to touch the data is flagged with this access to customer data path, which will kick off customer lockbox um, and uh, kick off an audit trail as well that you can always see, by the way, through the Management Activity API. If any Microsoft operator runs any script against a mailbox in your tenant, or um, any AD property on your tenant, you can see it through that activity API. So always audited. And then with customer lockbox, we actually stop the process until you approve it. And that approval expires in half an hour. By the way, if, if a human is needed to intervene in something, we usually need it done fast, right? If, if it can't self-heal and it's woken someone up, something has to get done quickly because it, it's an outage or it's a loss of service. So customer lockbox, um, asks that if you do intervene as the owner of the data, that you respond to any request quickly. All right, so in summary, 
It's not just about us meeting compliance. You know, we've got FedRAMP, we've got SOC, um, but I think of compliance as a backstop. It's not just about defense in depth, but it's about us as a cloud service provider being smart about the unique properties of the cloud of first principles that we can apply to the way that we engineer security into the fabric to create a better story than a single organization can do on a given, on a single premise. And so the, the three mandates we have around these three triangles are to make sure our security learnings from one customer benefit all. And again, you can learn more about, um, about secure score, by the way, in that 2166. That's the breakout session that we'll do a deep dive into secure score. Also, Phil Newman's sessions are great uh, in terms of Office 365 and advanced threat protection. Um, the stack, owning the stack, leveraging the fact that we, that we build the stack and it's very uniform for a given build uh, can heavily limit, uh, increase the prevention aspect of, of prevent, detect, and respond, heavily limit the surface area, and then we can do surgical targeted rules in order to, um, to protect through detections. And um, what that leads to, what our, what our cloud automation story leads to, and through central admin, we're able to keep humans at arm's distance from the service and only intervene when necessary and be constantly learning so that intervention lowers even as we scale. And uh, we do that by a focus on touchless operations, which accrues to both security and service health um, by making sure that it's our code, our trusted, hardened, coded paths and not people that operate our service. There is an entire breakout session on how we do secure access. So that lockbox diagram and how Taurus um, and Taurus accounts are given only cert-based access to the machines. There's an entire breakout session that will go into much more detail, uh, technical detail, deep dive into exactly how that's negotiated, how that works, how it expires. Um, and that is BRK3040. I think it's Thursday afternoon. So you can get more information on all of this through there. All right. I would love to hear feedback from you about this session. If uh, the session description matched what you heard here, if you are able to meet the two goals that I outlined at the beginning, which is to, to have, be able to have a conversation about how Office 365 does in for security, and have talking points to, um, you know, to, to provide insight to your board, to yourselves, to compete analysts if you're making decisions. And secondly, to change the conversation from some of the very traditional way that security is approached through defense in depth uh, into sort of the new innovation areas that we've been pursuing in our cloud service. All right, we've got a couple of minutes. I welcome questions. Please make them uh, contextual to the entire group. If you've got something very specific to the way you've deployed or the way you've rolled out, I am happy to meet you outside or to be here for a few minutes. But if you've got something that applies to the whole group, do feel free to ask it now. It's a, so the question was, is Azure separate? Is, is that a separate security team? They have a separate security ops team, but in terms of the technology, they are one of the Taurus adopters, so they're using the same model for secure access. We actually built it, though, in Office 365, so um, it, it's being driven from the SaaS cloud. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you for waking up on this fine Tuesday morning. Uh, have a great rest of Ignite.